Uh, I think that a lot of us can really, uh, well, feel a personal connection to such an iconic animal as a gorilla. And so I'm personally very, very excited to have you here and to, to learn more about what it is that you all are doing and the progress that you've made and what needs to be done uh, still. So uh, welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. All right, great, great. So I'm gonna kick off with the, the first uh, question. So can you uh, tell us uh, about Gorilla Doctors, the sort of about the heart and the mission of the organization? Yeah, you bet. So Gorilla Doctors is a partnership with the nonprofit Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project that started in 1986 at the request of Diane Fossey, and I can talk more about that, and the Wildlife Health Center at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And we work together to bring life-saving veterinary care to wild eastern gorillas, which makes up mountain gorillas and the um, growers gorillas or eastern lowland gorillas. So I think, you know, the gorilla, as Demian kind of pointed to, is very iconic. You know, we kind of think of Tarzan and <laughs> all these adventures going into the jungle and coming across a gorilla, or especially, uh, you know, popularized by Jane Goodall, right, and the gorilla work that she's done and things like that, and especially what you guys are doing as well. Um, so tell us a little bit about what brought you into being into this field, especially with gorillas, you know, um, not only are these majestic creatures that normally people see in the zoos or on documentaries, but what is so important about the gorilla, not only to you, but perhaps to the world? And please tell us about how you got involved with that. Sure. So first, really quickly, Jane Goodall, her specialty is chimps. And you know what? I'm glad I asked right. that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, there is you know, a difference. There, there is. is. A difference. There is. And, you know, we chimp and gorilla people, like we have our camps, right? So, right. you know, that was like blasphemous. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Jane's amazing. Um, but the gorilla, the sort of iconic gorilla woman was Diane Fossey. Mm. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And they Good. came well, kind of... Yeah they kind of came up at the same time. They were both, you know, mm. initially employed by Lewis Leakey and, and mm. didn't have the scientific backgrounds. And, you know, he really believed that women in general were probably better suited to study primates. Who knows if that's true or not. Um, mm. And then he also wanted women who weren't going to be biased uh, originally through a, a, you know, sort of Western education of, animal behavior. And so that was sort of how they both got started. And of course, Jane's gone on to just do extraordinary things for the world. And unfortunately, we lost Diane in 1986, um, actually December 1985. So um, that was a real loss for the world. But mm -hmm. to answer your question, um, my background is, um, and you're right about gorillas, right? There's just something quite magical about them. And, and it makes my job a lot easier, quite frankly, to get people to rally behind our work. Um, for me, it started uh, when I was 12 in the seventh grade. Our science teacher assigned an endangered species report as a project in our class. And she literally kind of passed around this fishbowl with little folded up pieces of paper. And you had to pick one out. And that was the animal you were assigned. And I just happened to pick the mountain gorilla. And I went to the library because that's, you know, it was still books back then. There was no internet. And I opened my first book and I saw a black and white photo of mountain gorillas. And that was it. There we go. <laughs> so, yeah. so your journey yeah. started wow. really early. <laughs> so it what did. brought you to be part of Gorilla Doctors? What was that pull to be part of this organization specifically? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, it sounds singular, like that I have been of singular purpose and focus my whole life. Um, my career hasn't necessarily taken that route, um, but it did for a long time. So in school, I was very focused. And a, a year after I first sort of became obsessed with gorillas, there was, and I was living in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. Um, the Columbus Zoo was hosting an international gorilla workshop. Um, and we're bringing in experts from around the world. And they were really looking at how to um, find that intersection in what researchers in the wild were learning about gorilla behavior and bringing it into a captive environment to create a more naturalistic um, habitat and behavioral dynamic for gorillas in captivity. Uh -huh. I think I was now 13 and I had gone and I had gotten to know the keepers at the zoo and they were doing this conference and they were like, well, you can come, but you can't come alone because you're too young. Your mom has to come. And so my mom made this deal with me. If I raised the money for the fee, she'd come. Um, 
And the two keynote speakers of the workshop were Drs. Kelly Stewart and Alexander Harcourt, both of whom had done their PhDs with Diane Fossey and then ran the Karasoki Research Center in Rwanda, which is where the, the research site Diane set up. Oh. And I had read the books, all the books that were out there, and Sandy and Kelly had, were in the books and their pictures were in the books. And I was just kind of like, oh my God, you know, it's like, for me, it was like a movie star kind of thing. And so they were the keynotes and I waited in line and I talked to them and I had them autograph my book. And, and then I started writing letters with Kelly and they were based at UC Davis out in California. So fast forward 10, 11 years, and I ended up out there in grad school with them as my grad school advisors. So then long winding career, all this kind of stuff, um, had my own business uh, working in East Africa and started donating a portion of every sale to Gorilla Doctors. I was introduced mm -hmm. to Gorilla Doctors through Kelly because they because cool. Gorilla Doctors is based at UC Davis. So there was this long history and connection. It was kind of like this whole full mm -hmm. circle thing, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so then Gorilla Doctors invited me to join the board of directors, which I did. So I was on the board for a short time. And then this position opened up, part-time position in communications for the organization. And I went to our executive director, Dr. Kirsten Gilardi, and I said, literally no one on the planet is allowed to have this job but me. What do I have to do? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to step off the board and apply for the job. Hmm. And luckily I got it. And that, you know, so right. that, that's where we are. Well, I think right. with a demand like that, they, they kind of got to, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, guess. I didn't really give them much choice, but. So, so can you, I, I'm curious, can you share with us a little bit then about, uh, like, because you mentioned captivity and I was thinking, well, you've got a certain number, small number, right, relatively of, of, um, of gorillas in the wild. And then you've got a certain number in captivity. And, and I don't really, and I think a lot of our listeners don't, like myself, really understand um, that sort of that bigger picture. And so in terms of like, I think of captivity as, as being, uh, uh, well, on one hand, it's, it's people want to go look at gorillas, right? So that's uh, the, the bad part of it. On the other hand, uh, there might be some opportunities to save uh, gorillas or preserve their lives when they don't have habitat or other reasons. So just to sort of understand the bigger picture about sort of the the, the life uh, overall of the species, can you kind of share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, great question. So there's four subspecies of gorilla, um, all of which are found in Africa, right? Sort of naturally. Um, there's two Western subspecies. So on the more West coast of the continent, the Western lowland gorilla, which is what you typically see in zoos and the cross river gorilla, which is critically endangered. There's it's a population of maybe like 300 individuals that was only recently discovered in the last couple of decades as its own separate subspecies. Uh -huh. And then there's the two Eastern subspecies, which is where our work focuses. That's the mountain gorilla and the Eastern lowland gorilla or the growers gorilla. Um, that's, the growers are found only in Democratic Republic of Congo. Mountain gorillas are found in Rwanda, Uganda and DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo um, in two distinct populations. They are in fact, mountain gorillas are the only great ape in the wild whose numbers are currently increasing. Um, it's, a, it's a rare sort of conservation success story that has mm -hmm. been an international effort um, with a lot of leadership from the countries where they live and the governments um, protecting them, you know, bringing ecotourism to the world um, to help save the gorillas. Um, as far as captive, again, you mostly find Western lowlands. You're not really seeing any sort of captive efforts as a way to save the species anymore. You definitely have sanctuaries on the continent of Africa where uh, in West Africa, you still have, um, well, actually in East Africa too, there's still quite a bit of wildlife trafficking. Um, gorillas don't tend to be the target. Um, you get a lot more chimpanzees that you're seeing um, mm -hmm. with wildlife trafficking than gorillas. Um, and in the case of mountain gorillas, they rarely ever survive captivity. Um, there's the Senkwekwe Center at Virunga National Park in Congo that is home to two captive mountain gorillas. Um, and they're the only two that have ever survived um, captivity for any long period of time. Mm -hmm. They had four, um, but they're down to two now. Um, as far as captivity and the, you know, the push and pull of that, right? Um, I can speak for myself that seeing a gorilla in a zoo was at the San Diego zoo when I was nine. Um, 
I think was one of the initial sparks before I ever even realized it. And, and I think that that's, that is the power of zoos is to spark young minds and dreams um, to, for people to grow up and become conservationists. Um, there's, there's power and, and beauty in that. Um, at the same time, as someone who's trying to preserve gorillas in the wild, it's hard to see animals in captivity, right? Um, yes, that's, that's not where they belong. Um, right. But, you know, it, the Houston Zoo is one of our biggest supporters and has been. And, and the work that they've helped us achieve has helped literally a in, critically endangered species recover from a low of 250 mm. individuals left on the planet. Today, mm. we have just over a thousand mountain gorillas. Mm. That's extraordinary, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's, not just that's us. Great. Right, not just gorilla doctors, right? International yes, effort, right. but mm -hmm. but yes. we have a lot. We have the Houston Zoo, you know, as a as a long time, and the Columbus Zoo as well, um, long time loyal supporters in in our work. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Yeah, you know, and so you know, you talk about this success story of going from two fifty to over a thousand. Um, tell us a little bit of the ripple effects of you know helping these populations grow or prevent from these populations decreasing, and what are the ripple effects we're finding from you know recovering these populations? Great question. Um, so, what was I? I was going to say too that in twenty nineteen. This was another rare conservation win. Mountain gorillas were reclassified from critically endangered to endangered um, because mm -hmm. of this recovery. As far as the ripple effect, boy, that's such a great question because gorilla, mountain gorillas in some ways are a unique example because they they can benefit from what we call extreme conservation, right? We can provide individual veterinary care to an ill or injured gorilla. Um, their dynamic, the way that they're sort of isolated in protected national parks allows for these things, right? We've been able to habituate them to the presence of humans so they don't run away, which allows us to do visual observations of their health, allows us to administer medication via dart if we need to, right? Which is less invasive than mm -hmm. anesthetizing them and doing a full hands-on intervention, which we sometimes do. Um, so we can identify them as individuals. So like just how humans have fingerprints, gorillas have nose prints that are unique to each and every gorilla. That's how we identify them, right? Oh, so, so we can do a lot, yeah. So we can do a lot of really hands-on, extreme, you know, following their behavior over time, following population health trends, following individual health over time, right? We have decades of records. Um, it's, it has allowed for um, this kind of recovery that, that doesn't often happen with other species where in great apes, you're getting, you know, tremendous habitat loss still, right? In forests, all gorillas, at least Eastern gorillas, um, mountain gorillas specifically, live in protected national parks that are effectively surrounded by islands of humans, uh, human, you know, population and communities. Um, that allows for daily tracking, right? I mean, the, the mountain gorillas have park rangers that are with them every single day. There's mm -hmm. anti-poaching patrollers who sweep the forest and remove snares. Um, so mm -hmm. so the, the ripple effect that there has been also employment, right? For the local communities and the people, um, the, the, the rise of not just this idea of ecotourism, but the combination of wildlife tourism and community development and that they need to go hand in hand. Um, you know, we're even starting to see that there could be some health consequences of the population rebounding because the, the space in which they're in has not grown, but the numbers have, you know, and so we're, we're looking at, you know, we, we do scientific research as well, not just veterinary care. Are there you know, potential health consequences for the population becoming more dense than it has been historically. Thank you. And I just have a, a quick small question to go off of that so people can kind of gain a perspective when it comes to audience, myself included. So <clears throat> do you guys have kind of a, a guesstimate? I'm sure you don't have necessarily records of this, but do you have a guesstimate of what the healthy level of population that these gorillas in especially the eastern side of Africa, what they were before we had such low numbers and what caused all these low numbers to become a thing just decades before? 
Yeah. So uh, I don't have specifics. Um, historically, it would have been that uh, in terms of numbers, I don't have specifics what they were. Um, it's been a very long time since we've seen what their maybe historical geographic distribution would have been from when the forests were still there, right? So when human populations were much lower, much less dense, before a lot of deforestation happened, before the government stepped in and protected what was left, um, you know, their distributions would have been a lot greater. Now, mountain gorillas specifically probably weren't as distributed, say, as like the eastern lowlands or western lowlands, where you have these massive tracts of forest, because they're mountain gorillas, they have specific ranges higher up in the mountains, right? So, so they would have been a bit more limited anyway. Um, but honestly, as far as historical numbers, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, and I, I just kind of wanted to highlight that for our audience is that, you know, there's all, all these animal conservation efforts out there to try and preserve these numbers because we don't really have record of what they were before, but we know that this is not a healthy number when you reach like 250, right? And it's such a small area and it's going, that definitely was not the number prior. So kind of looking at how human development has happened and especially imperialism and, you know, all these um, mm. global historical events that have really impacted animals and that we don't actually really know what the healthy numbers were prior. It's kind of scary. And I just kind of wanted to put that out there to kind of get people to realize that our impact could be even deeper than we realize because we don't have historical context. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there and I'll let Demian ask the next question. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to return for a second to what you were talking about. So it, it, it seems that, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm imagining that sort of ignorance of the depth of the problem or the fact that, you know, that there weren't going to be gorillas anymore wasn't something that probably occurred to people uh, back in the times when they were destroying their habitat or, or, or directly killing the, the animals. Uh, and, and then of course, um, at some point, uh, uh, you know, somebody realized that they need to step in and do something. And obviously that's happened and the efforts are, uh, well, world famous really. Uh, but um, uh, it's, uh, can you speak to that just a little bit more than and say, so, uh, you know, if we were to look at right now, like what currently are the biggest threats that the, that gorillas in general are facing and, and what is, uh, uh, well, you know, what needs to be done about it? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. okay. you know, the, the biggest threats for the species as a whole, uh, is probably you know forest loss and habitat, and deforestation. Um, in West Africa, the bushmeat trade uh, is quite large. Um, you have wildlife trafficking. Those are sort of some of the big buckets for wildlife in general. Uh, with with gorillas, um, and you know in eastern gorillas, the biggest threats really are disease and trauma, traumas, injury, snares, things like that. Um, but, dis but disease is a major threat. Um, you know, gorillas we know are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. Um, you know, knock on wood, to date, we haven't had any gorillas in the wild test positive that we've tested, um, but they are susceptible. Um, and, you know, when the gorillas in the San Diego Zoo first tested positive in January of 2021, you know, it was this sort of, everybody had been white knuckling it, you know, what would happen? And, and there were people out there saying, oh, COVID could wipe out gorillas and all this kind of stuff. And we were a little bit more conservative in our, you know, sort of predictions because we didn't, you know, we don't know, right? We don't know how it's going to present and if how different it could be from how it was in humans. Um, but when most of the gorillas at the San Diego Zoo recovered without requiring any treatment, that was sort of our first kind of deep breath um, since right. the pandemic had started. But they're, you know, they're highly susceptible to Ebola, which is, you know, much higher mortality rate. Um, in fact, we've seen whole sort of mini populations of Western lowland gorillas effectively disappear um, from an Ebola outbreak. Um, so you know, and those are the diseases we know about, um, you know, as we've all learned firsthand, you know, they can emerge from 
anywhere at any time. And so, you know, that's, we're always very vigilant about that. Um, you know, trauma from snares, that's actually reduced quite a lot over the last several decades. Um, and again, that's the vigilance of these rangers and these anti-poaching patrollers that go in and, and sweep the forest for snares. And, and the other thing is because they're with them every day, if, if there's a gorilla caught in a snare, we get a call and rush into the forest that day. Um, you know, and, and so what is sorry to interrupt, what is the reason for these snares just to understand like the snares are there to to catch other animals or for food or, or what are the reasons that those snares are in place? Yes, great question. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a bit. I apologize. Um, it's okay. Yeah, so such a great question. The snares are typically set. Uh, they are poachers. It, they are technically entering the forest illegally. You know, um, to your point, Anastasia, about imperialism and historical context, this is land that they used to be able to hunt freely, right? Um, and they're just trying to feed their families. So they're typically trying to set them for things like small antelope, um, bush pigs, things that they would be able to then feed their families with and or sell in the local market. And mm -hmm. what can happen is gorillas can kind of come along and the young ones, especially, which are curious and playful and they can get caught mm -hmm. um, typically around their, you know, their wrists or their hands or their feet. Um, and, you know, the way snares work is as you pull, they get tighter, right? And so it can cut off circulation, it can break the skin right. and cause a wound. Historically, before there were veterinarians, they could get infected. Um, infection could lead to illness and death, right? Mm -hmm. And this was one of the things that Diane, you know, kind of made this cry for in the early 80s, that she knew veterinary care could make a huge impact on the decline. And, and so she put this call out and Ruth Kiesling, the Morris Animal Foundation basically answered that call. And the first gorilla doctor arrived in Rwanda in 1986. And, and that was how we began as a single American veterinarian. Today we're an international team and all of our veterinarians on the ground are from the countries where we work in Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's excellent. I'm really, I really love the fact that you guys work with the local populations in that because, you know, we've heard in the past of all these organizations that kind of come in and they, they do what they want and then they kind of leave. <laughs> and they're Helicopter, so like, helicopter conservation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right, so right. <clears throat> Damien and I are, are very diligent in making sure we talk with organizations that don't do that. We want to make sure that we highlight organizations that are working with the local. And I love that, you know, it also helps employ those people, as you mentioned, it really brings up employment and everything. And it also builds up the skills too of that community so that we can gain more sustainability um, in, on the ground as well as with the help that comes in. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Just want to give big kudos to you guys. And <laughs> You know, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, capacity right. building is a really big part of our mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Houston Zoo, again, has provided funds for many years to help um, our staff and other people in the country get advanced degrees. Um, you know, when we do internships and, you know, work sort of study programs, it's all, you know, people from those countries. You, you know, we, we don't always get it right, you know, because we're, we're kind of actively doing our own analysis of, you know, sort of decolonizing, mm -hmm. you know, conservation um, and, and understanding, you know, what that the Western perspective brings, you know, value and hindrance, right? And mm -hmm. that's part of the reason that local leadership is so important because no one's going to understand the dynamics better than people who are from the country where we're working, right? So, so our job in the States is this kind of stuff, right? Like raise awareness, raise funds, you know, make it possible for our teams over there to do what they already know how to do and do best. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, big kudos to that. Hey, we're trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about what's going on with Gorilla Doctors uh, specifically and what you guys are currently working on or that you're really excited about that you're currently working on or what perhaps may be coming up here soon. That's a big question. Man, if I was rambling before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so our mission, first and foremost, is to provide veterinary care when a gorilla is ill or injured, right? And so we do that by regular, you know, monitoring of their health. And we do that visually, you know, we go into the forest. And that's something that's also really important uh, that people sometimes miss about our work is all of our work is done in the forest. That's our hospital. We never remove an animal from the forest to provide treatment. And we always provide treatment surrounded by 
the gorilla family, right? So very often our vets are, you know, working and the silverbacks are agitated and charging and, you know, while we're trying to provide care. Um, It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty kind of extraordinary. I'm biased, but I think it's pretty extraordinary. Um, Yeah, it is. So so that's our (laughs) core mission. It always will be. Um, We also do scientific research looking at, you know, different types of impacts of health population level trends. Um, You know, we look at gastrointestinal parasites. That's something we're, we treat a lot um, and, and presents, across the, you know, the two different populations, the one in Uganda, the Bwindi population, and then the, the Virunga population, which spans um, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. Um, so we look at long-term trends over that, trying to determine what are the causes, you know, uh, gorillas are susceptible to human pathogens. We talked about that with COVID, what other types of things might they be getting exposed to? Where's it coming from? Things like that. Um, And then we also, a big part of our sort of direction in the future is is really starting to look at, you know, not trading off achieving our mission by further contributing to, you know, climate change and, you know, habitat, you know, all the different things that make up the moment we're in, you know, for the challenges that we face. Can we operate as a nonprofit in wildlife conservation and and do that with as little sort of environmental impact as possible, right? You know, we we fly over there, huge carbon, right? Footprint, you know, do we have to? Do we have to go as often? Not really, right? We've got an amazing team there. You know, we don't need to just pop in every once in a while, you know, and, and, um, you know, and really looking at that and, and, and planning out that, you know, that future of what, what does it mean to be, uh, you know, a, a nonprofit organization operating today with the challenges we face and stay focused on our mission. For me, uh, getting in touch with you all and, and having you on our podcast today is so important because, because of the fact that the gorilla is such an iconic animal and, and obviously with a limited species, you know, uh, saving those animals with, through veterinary care is, is essential. And because we can't just expect it for them to sort of manage it all on their own, especially with decreased habitat and no place to go and live and expand their populations really. Uh, and, and, but the fact that it's an iconic animal, it, it means that it's an example because, you know, there's plenty of human being examples of, of, uh, of people that are amazing people. I mean, it's, uh, but, but the reality is, is that we need to look towards, uh, towards animals and, and uh, we need to respect animals and, and the fact that we're sharing uh, this planet with them and that, uh, and that I don't, I, I, it makes me really sad. Uh, I remember reading an article years ago in National Geographic. You probably remember there was a murder of a of a of a large male uh, gorilla, and and it was um, and I, and I saw this picture of them sort of carrying the body, and it, it made me really really sad. And I actually brought tears to my eyes, and I just I just couldn't understand why why don't people care more? And and I'll never really understand that to be honest, but but. This is really what uh, what I wanted to speak about just for a minute here is just to say that that the work that you all are are doing is important because it needs to inspire people to respect all the other uh, living creatures that are on this planet and not just place so much importance always on people. Uh, We are important, obviously, because we're people and we and we want to live and be happy, just like every other kind of animal out there. But but we need to we need to share we need to be responsible and we need to help the planet at the same rate that we're hurting it i mean what can be more iconic than an animal that is so similar to us right and and that these are literally representing the entire animal kingdom um first of all very well said what what you were speaking to i think it's it's such a complex and nuanced moment that we're in mm-hmm. Um, you know, gorillas are what we call an umbrella species, which is exactly what you were speaking to, right? So protecting gorillas protects the forest that they live in. Forests are great carbon sinks, right? For carbon capture. Um, Protects all the other plants and animals and insects that make up the forest that they live in. 
So they, you know, saving gorillas, you know, our vets say that when we save gorillas, we save ourselves. And, you know, it's, it's true on so many levels, you know, from the sort of very practical to in my particular case, I find that almost a spiritual calling. Right. Um, And, you know, and I'm getting, I'm getting a bit philosophical here, but Toni Morrison said that the, 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 the purpose of freedom is to free others. And, and I think people who work in conservation, people who are doing like what you're doing, creating a platform for awareness and for voices to be heard and, and for inspiration to happen. Um, it, there's a collective movement, right? It's that's in the right direction. And what we're doing is creating, I think, an opportunity to help free the minds of others who it, it isn't that they don't care, right? We, I, I don't believe that. I choose not to believe that. We don't know what we don't know until we do, right? Besides the obvious of, of donating money, uh, which certainly we encourage our listeners to do, uh, what are some, some one or two ways that, uh, that our listeners or that people, anybody that we, can, that we can make aware of what you all are doing can, can support gorilla doctors and the work that you all are doing and just in general gorillas? The position we're in is one of extraordinary privilege, right? We have the freedom to think about these things, to take action, to, to change our own behavior because we have freedom from poverty, oppression, hunger, right? You know, when, when you are just trying to feed your family, you don't necessarily have the freedom to choose something else. We do. So it's our responsibility to do whatever we can with wherever we are in our lives in this particular moment to try to make a difference. And that could just be, you know, look, I'm not a huge fan of zoos, but it could be that you take your child to the zoo, right? And introduce them to to the animals that we share this planet with. Because as a kid, you know, when we see these things, we also see things anew through the eyes of children. So, you know, one of the things with gorillas that can get tricky for people who are really far away and who may never see them in the wild and who, who it's like, well, what can I do, you know, besides donating low hanging fruit, right? But maybe you don't have a lot of disposable income. So maybe it's just, you know, reading some articles, maybe it's starting to think about your individual carbon footprint, right? Because if each one of us thought about one thing we could do to reduce our carbon footprint, and that could just be, I don't, I hate to say recycling because, you know, the report that came out recently that the U.S. recycled like less than 5% of its plastic, you know, uh, that was depressing. Um, But five is better than zero, (laughs) you know. Right. Conservationists are by nature optimists, which you would kind of think the opposite because we're on the front line seeing everything that's happening. Um, but because we're on the front line seeing everything that's happening, we know about all the people working together to make a difference. And I find that really inspiring. You know, one thing that we have always found in common with all of our guests, and you just said it, is that conservationists, whether it's with the uh, environment or animals, or even those who are in, uh, more on the humanitarian side, um, they're all optimists. And they're all on the ground floor. They're all seeing basically daily acts of evil in some ways, or daily pain, right? And yet... There's this overarching optimism of we can do it, we can make change, we we are doing it right now. All it, it all it takes is some added support. Just kind of wanted to put that out there that those who are listening do if you feel compelled by this to help, go to Gorilla Doctors, go to all the social media links that we have wherever you're listening or watching this podcast episode, follow them on social media, do your volunteering through sharing having conversation, donating a dollar or a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or a million dollars, whoever you are out there, then whatever disposable income you can do. All of these facets are needed and every, and these kind of causes need that army to push that forward. So I wanted to put that out there that we all are optimistic in how this is moving forward. Even though we have our dark days, <laughs> we are all optimistic and how we can change things because we can and that's kind of the hopeful side of our soul is saying we can make change. So now let's take action and do it. 
beautifully said. And, you know, and I think it's, it's very easy to get paralyzed and overwhelmed. And so it's, it's just start wherever you are with whatever you can. And, you know, maybe that's tending a small garden, right? It, it is no less meaningful than being out in the forest, providing veterinary care. It, you know, to the gorillas, it's, it all matters. That's a huge part of our approach. We call it one health, right? The health of one impacts the health of all. You know, we each have our own unique role to play and every single one is just as meaningful. So, so wherever you can participate. Uh, even if it's just the next time your friends offer to buy you one additional drink, say, no thanks, but you know what? I would like that five bucks to give to Gorilla Doctors, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, really, it's, it's like amazing <laughs> how... <laughs> it's amazing how many little things there are that can be done if we really start asking ourselves that question. And Demi, and I think you had a really cool fundraising idea right there. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously. That's why I laugh so hard because we, we were doing this campaign called Growing Up Gorilla. And we had kind of done some math and figured out that it costs roughly $5 a day to monitor the health of one infant gorilla. And, and when we did it last year, we had something like 58 infants that we were currently kind of monitoring the health of across the three countries. And so that was the whole thing. It was like $5 will monitor the health of one baby for one day, you know, and that so $5 has real impact. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Amy, and with Gorilla Doctors. We really appreciate you being here and really educating not only Demian and I, but our audience on the importance of gorillas, the environment, and really as uh, humanity as total, how this is all really intertwined. And so everyone who's listening, please go to Gorilla Doctors and all the links that we have below, whether you're watching or listening to this, follow them, share, be part of the army to help save these gorillas and support these great causes. So thanks again, Amy, for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me and creating this platform for people like me. Thank you for listening to the Good Viral Podcast and being part of the conversation. If you are inspired by this episode, go to our website at goodviral.org, where you can find resources and listings from the episode to continue good efforts. Like, comment, and share this episode to any or all of your social media channels. It's really easy to take a small action, and maybe you'll inspire a big result. When good goes viral, the world gets better.